All right, well, let's pray. We get started today as we kind of get to the end of Habakkuk. Not sure how long we're going to be today, but let's see what the Lord has to say. Let's pray. Father, we um we rejoice today. We thank you for the privilege to come before you, Lord. We are just so thankful, even again for the reminder of what worship will be like in heaven. Um, mm -hmm. All nations and creeds and races and languages, all ascribing worship to you. And so we thank you today. We pray, Lord, that you might just uh, help us, Lord, as we rehearse it down here. <laughs> the purpose to get it right as best we can. Uh, and I pray, Father, that you'll just bless our time now, that you'll speak. Uh, speak through your word that you feel and fill it in as only you can. Lord, we just thank you what you're going to do in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I get my screen going here to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk once again and go through my steps here to get my, get my screen up. Okay. Habakkuk chapter three. Everybody see that? Okay. Give me a thumbs up and see it. Okay. All right. All right. Now, Habakkuk chapter three, as we talk about this point about the vision that now Habakkuk now has about the greatness of God. And so actually, I'll just start reading at verse one. Okay. Uh, Habakkuk chapter three, verse one, the scripture says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigunah. Oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. And in wrath, remember mercy. God came from Tima, the Holy One from Mount Heron. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. <laughs> Did we just see that? <laughs> his brightness was like the light. His, he had rays flashing from his hand. And there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth and he looked and startled the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The, the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. Oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger? against the rivers was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his, its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows, they went. At the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by, bearing, by laying bare from foundation to neck. You thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heap of great waters. And when I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord, is, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Amen. Amen. And so as we kind of pick this up today, we're talking about the vision that uh, Habakkuk had 
called the, he ponders the greatness of God. And so as we go to verses six and seven, we talk about this issue of how the Lord stood in power. Okay, he stood in power. Now, he begins to talk here about this whole issue, issue of measuring, how God measures the earth. Now, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, wars and when they're going to happen, you know, generals who are going to invade will push forward to gain ground or they'll fall back and retreat. Okay, there's only one or two things that are going to happen with the general. But what we see here is that the Lord had stood and he faced the enemy unafraid. Okay, because he had sent them. I mean, certainly the enemy that he was using to bring chastening to his people was under his control. Okay, so he stood and he faced the enemy unafraid. Now, he uses this word in verse six. He says he stood and measured the earth. Now, when you measure something, it's an indication that it's yours and you can do with it whatever you want. Okay, he measures the earth. Now, does that mean that he didn't know how, how uh, big the earth was? No, he made it. No, it's the idea of showing that it's his. Okay, he understood what he could do with it. Okay, now, when you measure something, it's like a preliminary step to action, right? That's just like the carpenter. Before the carpenter makes a cut, what does he do? He measures. And he measures again. You know, good carpenters always, you know, the saying is you, you measure twice and cut once. Okay, But they measure. They measure before they do something. Um, but it's a preliminary step to action. Now, it's also preparation for the execution of his wrath on the nations. God was getting ready to do something. Okay, He says, I'm measuring what I'm going to do right now. Go to Isaiah 40. Old Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 12, you read some verses here. I love these verses. And usually when I read Isaiah 40, I can't stop at those verses, but we'll see. <laughs> because it's good, okay? Isaiah 40, verse 12. He says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel? Or who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. Okay, I told you I couldn't stop. All right, verse 18. <laughs> this is good, all right? Verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not tie. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches, stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Okay, I'll stop here. I'm tempted to keep going, but I'm gonna stop, all right? <laughs> this is good stuff, right? But, but you get, you understand, right? <laughs> it's good stuff, right? But he is preparing for the execution of his wrath on the nations, okay, as he measures, all right, he measures. Now, now, the Lord is surveying, surveying the situation and estimating what he will need to do to execute his wrath on the nations, okay? He's, he's preparing to execute his wrath. So that's the whole idea of measuring. Now, now, one of the ways that the Lord reveals his power is when he shook the earth at Sinai before he delivered his law to Israel, okay? He shook the earth. All right, go to Exodus 19. Go there. Go to Exodus 19, okay? 
Go to Exodus chapter 19 at verse 16. He says, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called, called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through the gaze at the Lord and many of them perish, okay? Now, it's the whole idea of God illustrating his power, okay, before he delivered the law to Israel. Now, you would think after the Lord giving that demonstration of his power, those people would have acted right. You would think that, right? But did they? Nope. Now, are we any different? Nope. We are no different, okay? We are no different. He executes, he reveals his power Shows them who he is, a, picture, a small picture of who he is, and yet, when they had the first chance, they sinned against him, okay? Now, now the nations that laid up between Egypt and Canaan were terrified and wondered what would happen to them when Israel arrived on the scene, okay? They were terrified. Now, go back to Exodus. Let's read these verses. Exodus 15. I should have told you to keep your finger there. I'm sorry. But you don't mind turning, do you? I mean, you know, I think everybody knows what Exodus is, right? Exodus 15, beginning at verse 14. Okay. He says, the people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. They will be as still as, as a stone. Till your people pass over, O oh Lord. Till your people pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. In the place, O oh Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling. The sanctuary, O oh Lord, which your hands have established. Okay, go to chapter 23 of Exodus. Chapter 23, verse 27. Okay, and he says, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send him hornets before you, which will drive out the Hevite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you, okay? So well, they, that's why they were terrified. They knew the people were coming. They saw God working, okay? They knew what was going to happen when Israel arrived. God is demonstrating his power to his people, okay? Now, the whole issue of what he's saying here is this. The entire universe responds in fear at the approach of Almighty God. Everything was shaking and, and, and was showing who he is as he's about to bring this uh, uh, chastening to his people. Now, what does that say? It says his creation is at his disposal. He does whatever he wants to do with his, his, his creation, and his, his creation responds to him in reverence. That's the way he's designed, okay? Everything trembles at his presence, all right? His creation it's at his disposal. And all is to say that the Lord has his standing in power. He is standing in power. Okay. Now, now, as we move further, verses 16 through 19, we see this whole issue of faith. 
you know, are, we are affirming the will of God. This is where Habakkuk has now come. He's come to the place where he's affirming the will of God, okay? He's affirming the will of God. Now, the first thing we see here is that Habakkuk is now facing the fact that his nation will be invaded by the enemy. That he's heard it, but now he's embracing it, all right? He's heard it, he's prayed about it, but now he's embracing the fact that they're going to be invaded, okay? Now, because now he has realized that many are going to go into exile, and also many of them are going to lose their lives. Because yeah, there's a remnant that's going to return, but they're going to be some who lose their lives while they're in exile. Right? All of this is part of the chastening of the Lord, of his people. Okay? Now, if God will do this to his people, what, what will be the end result for those who reject him? What a thought, huh? What a thought. Okay, but many are going to go into exile and many will be slain. Okay, now the land's going to be ruined and the temple is going to be destroyed. All of this God is allowing when he allows his enemy to ride over his people. The land they were living in is going to be ruined and the temple is going to be destroyed. Now, now in spite of those realizations, Habakkuk says he's still going to trust God no matter what. Wow, see, that's real faith. That, see, that's the issue of faith. Regardless of what you see, and you don't even understand it, but trust him anyway. My goodness. Ah, ah, is my faith there? Wow, that's a real thought. It's a real thought. But when I trust God, no matter what I see, no, even what I realize is about to happen, but trust him no matter what, okay? Now, also, he says in verse 16, he says, I'm going to wait patiently on the Lord. He's going to wait patiently on the Lord. He says, when I heard my body tremble, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. He's going to rest. He's going to wait patiently on the Lord. Okay? Now, now here's a real good statement here. Listen, if Habakkuk had depended on his feelings, he would have never made this confession of faith. He says, I'm going to rest. Look, look at that statement. I might rest in a day of trouble. He's trembling, but he says, I'm going to rest anyway. I'm going to rest in a day of trouble. If he depended on even what his flesh was doing, Listen, he would have been in trouble. But he's come to the realization, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait patiently on the Lord. Okay? Now, because listen, he looks ahead and he saw the nation heading for destruction. He sees it. He has come to the realization it's going to happen. As we said in this title, uh, what faith is, we, we affirm the will of God. In other words, God said he's going to do it, so I'm going to rest in it. I may not, all, I may not completely agree with it. But I'm arrested in it because God's doing what he's going to do. And, and, and how I feel about it is not going to change the will of God. So I may as well embrace it. Okay? He saw the nation heading for destruction. But he embraced it. Okay? Also, now if he looked within, he's looking within, he saw himself trembling. Okay? He looks within. Looking around, he saw everything falling apart. But when he looked up by faith, he saw God. That, that's, that has to be the final solution, all right? Listen, I'm looking in, I'm struggling, I'm trembling. I'm looking around, I'm seeing everything about to fall apart. But what do I do? I look up. I got to raise my gaze. I got to look up. I got to look up. That's where, that's, where I, that's where my strength comes from. Regardless of what's happening around me, I got to trust. Amen. Minister Mosley, you just described what's going on now. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If this didn't just touch every one of those boxes and, you know, all the things that are going on around us, Absolutely. Knowing, knowing the destruction that's getting ready to come, knowing it's getting ready to come. And then, yes, mm -hmm. you do feel like things are falling apart. Yeah. And thank God that we can look to the hills from which cometh our help. Because man. if we look at man, he just depress you even more. But thank God Absolutely. for his faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Because, you know, you look at what's happening now and, you know, our agriculture, all of our resources, uh, you know, 
They, of course, man doesn't, you know, they can speculate what may happen, but they're talking about next year food shortages. Well, you know, all of that stuff they're talking about. Listen, we can't keep our eyes on that. We got to trust God. He said he will provide. He will provide. We got to trust. Him. We got to trust. Him. Just like a backer. If we depend on our feelings, we can't make up a confession of faith. And I'm going to wait on the Lord no matter what. The same thing for us. To see, yeah. see a backer. We're going to talk about this in a minute. But he's looking at all the stuff that's about to hurt the agriculture, the flocks. There's no herds. All there's no fruit on the vines. No olive. All that stuff's gonna dry up. He says, in spite of that, I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna trust God. I mean, we gotta embrace that. We gotta embrace that because just like Sister Paula said, that's where we are now. That's where we are now. We gotta trust. I mean, we if we listen to everything that comes on CNN, we'll be pulling our hair out. For some of us, it's a little easier than others, but you know, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but uh, but if we do, listen, we, we, listen, we'll be going crazy. We gotta look up, gotta look up. We have to affirm the will of God. We have to affirm the faithfulness of God. We've got to affirm the promises of God in my own heart. Yes. Okay. I gotta do that. I do. Hope everybody gets that. You gotta get that. You gotta get that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Damn. Now, now, here's the thing. Now, now he saw all this stuff happening around us and within himself. But this, this is what happens when he looks up. The fear vanished. The fear vanished. Now, you see that. That's what's happening here. Because he says in verse 17, though the fig tree may vanish. In other words, it may happen, but that's not going to shake me. He says, all the fear has vanished. Okay? Now, also... If I'm going to walk by faith, it means I got to focus on the greatness and the glory of God. That's what he does. Okay. To walk by faith means to focus on the greatness and the glory of God. Who is he? Who is he in my life? Who is he proving himself to be? He doesn't have to really do anything else to show us who he is, but he constantly does that. Because you know how we are. Listen, listen, let's be real about it. Now, the Lord did something yesterday, but today I need to see something. Come on, y'all. Be real. Let's be real. I need some amens. Come on, talk to me. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. You know, he did something yesterday, but today I need another, I need you to show me something else, Lord. <laughs> That's what we do, okay? But we got to focus on the faithfulness, the greatness, and the glory of God, okay? To walk by faith. Now. Amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> but that's what we do. That's what we do. Now, here's the statement. One of the marks of faith is a willingness to wait patiently for the Lord to work. Oh, my goodness. That brought a measure of conviction to me. It really did. When I really pondered that state, it really did. Because, you know, we want stuff now. We want doors to open now. That's what we want. Yes. <laughs> but one of the marks of faith is a willingness to wait patiently for the Lord to work. We don't know what he's working on, what he's. What, what, what he's working on in hearts of people and what pathways he's preparing. We just don't know. We don't know. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, and Minister Mosley, and sometimes while he's working and, and, and after the work is done, after he is answered, after he is given, then we can look back with clear vision and see what it was he was doing. When we're yeah. in it, waiting patiently for it, we just trust that he's doing the work that we can't see, that we can't figure out. But it's not until that 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 hope deferred, you know, makes yeah. the heart sick. But when desire comes, it is a tree of life. It's not until that tree of life moment and we look back and see all the things he was working in us, perfecting in us while yeah. we were waiting patiently for him. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Uh, I, you know, forgive me if I take a minute. I have to sit here because that I'm telling you, that statement spoke to me. I'm telling you, that thing hit me. I was like, yeah, that's exactly right. Impatience. Hey, we got to be. But faith says, I will wait patiently on the Lord. I got to wait. I got to wait. And, and how does the Lord teach me patience? Makes me wait. Uh, I never want to hear that. I never want to say, I don't like saying it, but it's the truth. Amen. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Look, you may not be saying thank you, Jesus, while you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, while I'm in it, because obviously there's something. There's something that you're holding back for whatever reason. So, yeah. Lord, until that time of your answer, let me just glorify your name. Let me just praise you and thank you for being Amen. who you are. 
in, in, mm -hmm. in, not just in my life, but in mm -hmm. the life of all of those, Lord, who trust you as Savior. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let me move on. <laughs> okay. okay. Now, here's the statement. Look at this first. Isaiah 28, verse 16. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Oh, oh my. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Or whoever is trusting will not act hastily. Whoever has faith in God will not act, will not act hastily. Because, you know, acting hastily gets us in trouble. I'm stepping out ahead of the Lord. I'm doing stuff the Lord didn't tell me to do. Or it wasn't time to do it. Just got to sit back and wait. Amen. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. Amen. I'm talking to me, y'all. Y'all, you ain't got to say amen. I'm talking to me, too. I'm talking to me. Me, too. <laughs> I'm talking to me. <laughs> okay. All right. Whoever believes will not act hastily. We got to wait. Okay. We got to wait. Okay. Uh, now, when you run ahead of God, you're going to get into trouble every time. Or, or if you run ahead of the Lord, you may actually miss the best that God has. See, I'm opening the door. That's not the best door, but God may have the best door down the road. That's why I got to wait. He, because listen, the Lord always has the best, always has the best for us. But the problem is we got to wait. We got to wait. We got to wait. Okay. But when we read ahead of the Lord, we're going to get ourselves in trouble every time. Every time. Oh. Willingness to wait. And that's what Rebecca comes to. Listen. I got to rest in a day of trouble. That means I'm waiting. I know the Lord's going to work, so I got to watch him. I got to I got to watch him do what he's going to do, and I got to trust him while I go through. Got to trust. Got to trust. Okay. When we run ahead of God, we're going to get into trouble. Now, now, here's some illustrations. Go to Genesis 16. Okay. Abraham. We all know this account, but let's read it. Okay. Genesis 16. Okay, Genesis 16, okay? The scripture says, ah, I almost said something. I'm not going to say that. I'll get in real trouble if I say what I what just came to my mind. <laughs> Let me read the scripture. Read the scripture, around, right? Genesis 16, verse 1. <laughs> okay. Now, Sarah, Abraham's, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Oh my. <laughs> then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. Oh, my goodness. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarah, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarah, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man and his hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. He shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. Well, she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Beer Leha Roi. Observe, it is between Kadesh 
and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Ma, ma, ma. So we all know what happened there. I mean, he just made a mess. He made a mess, but God was still faithful. You know, we understand that account. God was still faithful. Uh, Ishmael wasn't the one of promise, but God still used it. Okay? He still used it. Okay? And that's what he does. We mess up, and the Lord always fixes it. <laughs> he always fixes it. Okay? All right? Now, here's another illustration. Here's Moses. He tried to deliver the Jews by his own hand. Okay? Exodus chapter 2. Okay, go there. Go to Exodus. Y'all don't mind turning the Bible, right? We are a Bible study, right? Exodus chapter 2. Okay, Exodus chapter 2. I got to get there too. Okay. Now, here we go. Exodus 2, he says, A man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it on the reeds by the river's bed. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. <laughs> so the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew. She brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. Now it came to pass in those days was Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way, but he saw no one. He killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Okay, we'll stop there. But it's the same issue with Moses, okay? Uh, Isaiah 3.15, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength, okay? Many times we think we have to display it, excuse me, by, you know, our strength and our, our confidence by standing up. Sometimes the call is to sit down and wait. Sometimes it takes more strength to sit down and wait in confidence than it does to rise up. Come on. That, hey, listen, that's the call. That's the call. See, that's, that's what meekness is. Meekness is, is, is authority and strength under control. That's what it is. Okay? And sometimes that's the call. And quietness and confidence, that's our strength. Now, when you know the Lord is working, you can afford to wait quietly and let him have his way. When you know he's working. And Habakkuk knows God is working. He knows he's about to do something. So what else are you going to do but sit down and wait and watch him have his way, okay? Now, because uh, in chapter 2 of Habakkuk, verse 3, God commanded him to wait. He told him to wait. Chapter 2, verse 3, he says, he says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, okay? You see that. But at the end, it will speak and not lie. Look at this. Though it tarries, wait for it. You see that? God's commanding him to wait. He says, because why? It will surely come. It will not tarry. In God's time, it was coming. So God told him to sit down and wait. You just wait. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You just got to wait till this time. Okay? 
And look at this. God's commandments are God's enablements. Look at that. God's commandments are God's enablements. In other words, if God told him to wait, he was going to give him the strength to do it. He's going to have the strength to do it. God's commandments are God's enablements. Okay? Whatever he calls me to do, he give me the strength to do it. Scripture says, listen, faithful who he is, he who calls you, who also will do it. He will also do it. He will give you the strength to do it, whatever it is he calls you to do. God's commandments are God's enablements. Okay? Now, now, no matter what we see and no matter how we feel, we must depend on God's promises and not allow ourselves to fall apart. Let me read that again. No matter what we see and no matter how we feel, we must depend on God's promises and not allow ourselves to fall apart. Okay? We got to trust. No matter what we see, no matter how we feel, we got to trust. And it's even again to what Sister Paula said, that's even what we see happening today. We got to depend on God's promises and not, not allow all this to cause us to fall apart. Okay? We can't fall apart. Now, and God gives us several verses to encourage us to wait. Okay, there's several places. Now, Exodus 14, 13, he tells us, listen, stand still. The rest of us says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still. still. Don't do anything. You just stand still and watch me. Watch me. Or, or I put it another way, watch my smoke. Watch what I do. <laughs> you just watch what I do. And Ruth 3, 18, he says, listen, sit still. Sit down. Take a seat and watch. Stand still and sit still. And then Psalm 46, 10, be, be still. still. Be still and know that I am God. I am God. Stand still, sit still, still. and be still. Ah, ah. That's the call many times. The call, where the call is to wait and to trust and, and, and to believe God for what he said. Trust him. He's going to do what he said. Trust him. Stand still, sit still, and be still. Mm -hmm. But the hard part is, is the word still. We can't be still. <laughs> we got to be doing something. Sometimes the call is to be still. Okay. Still. And, and keep our eyes up. Our focus is up. Okay. Stand still, be still, and sit still. Okay. Now, in verses 17 and 18, he says, he begins to talk about rejoicing in the Lord. Okay. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord. 17 and 18, he says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the labor of the olive may fail, and the yield the, the fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I will rejoice in the Lord. Now, Habakkuk is given a testimony of rejoicing no matter what. Okay? That's what he's saying. I mean, everything's about to dry up. All of that agriculture is about to dry up. He said, I'm going to rejoice no matter what. Okay? Now, you see, in that culture, you see the figs, the grapes, the olives, the grain, the sheep, the cattle were things of security, success, and prosperity. That's how they lived. And God was going to take all of that away. I'm taking it away. I'm drying up the land. He says, in spite of all that, I'm going to rejoice. Because if you think about it, Habakkuk was going to be a victim of that too. Because everything was drying up. Think about that. And yet, he says, I'm going to rejoice. I know it's getting ready to happen, but I'm going to rejoice anyway. That's what faith does. I got to look beyond that. I got to trust God. I got to trust him, okay? Now, if you take all of that away, it's going to result in a devastating impact to the entire society. The whole society was going to be ruined because of it. But God was doing something. He was after something. And he was doing what he needed to do to bring it to pass, okay? Now, God allowed all of that trouble it, that was going to befall his people. God did it. We want to blame it on the devil. Nope, the devil didn't do that. God did it. God did it. First thing we want to do, blame the devil. The devil did that. He's still killing, destroying. Nope, God did it. 
<laughs> he said, I'm going to do it. He's doing it. And God did it. He allowed all of that trouble that was to befall his people because he was doing the work. And just like this nation, God is slowly taking his hands off this nation. The stuff we see happening, man, we would have never seen happen 20 years ago. God is slowly taking his hands off this nation. He's allowing the trouble that is befalling this country. He's, he's allowing it. And guess what? He's keeping us while we, it's, we're in the midst of it. Yeah. He's keeping us. I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not wanting for anything. Our needs are being met. Gas prices are crazy. What? Tank's still full, though. Food prices are crazy. Well, guess what? The refrigerator full of food. Thank you, Lord. The Lord's keeping his people yeah. in the midst of it. That's what he does. That's what he does. Okay? That's why our security and our success cannot be in things. We have to trust God. We got to trust him. Got to trust him. God's allowing it, okay? Now, if our joy is rooted in anything that can be touched or tampered with, we have what's called an unstable joy. Because all of that stuff is temporary. All of that. The stuff that he, he, he lists here, you know, no fruit on the vines, no olives. No figs, no, no, no herds in the stalls. All of that stuff is temporary. If we are trusting in that, it's an unstable joy because all of that stuff can be taken away just like that. That's like even for us, that's why, you know, the stuff that we trust in, our jobs or whatever, we can't trust in that. We can't trust. It. Who's to say we had a job, we go in tomorrow and they say, you know what? We don't need you anymore. It could happen. It happens every day. It happens every day. Oh, <laughs> it yeah. could happen. So then what I, I got? I remember that one. I remember being called into um, a director's office and <laughs> he asked me to come in. So I bought, you know, so a couple of things, some documentation of my performance. And <laughs> he sat there and was telling me why um, why I, he was has to make a decision that he has to let me or this other uh, teacher go. So. Um, I was like, that's not what I wanted to hear. But I sat there and I let him give his little explanation. And I just said to him, you know, you, everything you've asked me to do, I have done. So I'll just wait. It's your decision to make. Mm -hmm. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, Lord, it's your decision to make. Amen. You know, what can I do? It's your decision. I've been in situations, and you know, I had to recall a situation I had been in many, many years before in which I sat in an office and heard a supervisor tell my husband that he was going to let him go. Mm -hmm. And I sat there, and it wasn't, again, I didn't, I didn't cry, I didn't break down, but I just sat there, and I've seen God just provide so, you know, the faithfulness of God in spite of Amen. our performance, Amen. you know, and, and, and he should really, like I said, we have unstable joy if we trust in these things. And I, I remember just one more thing before we go, um, just one more thing is that, you know, in the black community, <laughs> we have experienced, I know I have, my family um, has, has experienced poverty like, like no other. And one thing I learned through that poverty is that black folks know how to get it together when it comes to, if we have to survive, we'll do it. <laughs> you know, it's those white Amazing. folks, they, they want to jump out the window and, oh Lord, the stock market crashed. Yeah. I don't know what I'm yeah. going to do. But yeah. somehow we figure it out. God gives us wisdom and we figure it out. Mm -hmm. So Amen. that's another praise to our, the greatness and faithfulness of our God. Amen. You know, you know I, um, I'm where thinking the same thing about Sister Elise. I know um, back before they uh, had started to lay me off and everything. And I'm like, well, they laid me off. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll just go ahead and get my knee done and blah, blah, blah. And kept on going. And but the thing was, even before that, the Lord told me that day that they laid me off, take your things home. Everything that you brought to this place, you take it home with you. Uh -huh. And at first I wasn't going to do it. And I'm like, oh, I'll be back, you know, after everything. But again, before the end of the day, I took every, my plants, I brought everything home. 
Wow. And you know, and in that, you're like, Lord, I okay, I'm gonna do what you say, you know, and the after all of that outcome, using up all my leave, using even going to my um mutual of Omaha, you know, them paying me from you know for being out in the situation. And because I did not come back when they wanted me to come back, you know, I was the Lord said. I got this. It's not you and it's not your husband. Mm -hmm. I got this. Mm -hmm. So I retired. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, Lord, and have not skipped a beat. Yeah. You it's have to come to that him. place. Yes. You yes. have to come to that place of trust. And, uh, and again, okay. not, I, I couldn't say I could, I could trust this or trust that. You got to look upward and trust him. And that's the only way yeah. you can do it. And, and live, and I used to always say to myself, you know, girlfriend, you got to live low, you know, and good times, you can praise them. Bad times, you praise them too, but you got to learn how to live low. Amen. <laughs> and you'd be surprised what you can do without. That's right. That's Amen. Right. Yeah. That's do my own nails, do my own feet. I just don't cut my hair. Like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, go back, had to go back and do that. I've been yeah. up. Yeah. But God is faithful. Yes, he is. They're exceedingly and abundantly above all that my little finite mind could okay. ever ask or think. Because he goes beyond and beyond. Yes, he does. Yes, Amen. he does. Can I just take the last are... one? Say, say again. Is that Brian? Yes. Just finished physical therapy. Um, can I have my steak and lobster once a month? Well, I got to go low. <laughs> yeah, you can if, you, if you've got it like that. If not, brother, you better get yourself some, some steak and then be done with it. I, I, I turned 65 January 31st. I'm going to go on medic, transition to Medicare and all this stuff. So it's a new world coming. Oh, Amen. yeah, new world. And retirement new world. shortly after. Amen. Amen. Right. Sorry, brother. Lord got you. You got you. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. Give thanks for what you had. I'm, yes, I'm, right. I'm going to finish the lesson in a minute. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to share something with y'all after we finish. But, you know, okay. we talked about this issue of unstable joy. Now, now, here's the question. Where are you getting your joy? That's the question. Where does it come from? First of all, see, if you lose your job, where well, you still have joy. See, we just thought y'all just teach the lesson already for me. <laughs> if you lose your job, where well, you still have joy. See, it can't be... Our joy can't be re, uh, rooted in anything that can be touched or tampered with, okay? If you lose your job, will you still have joy? If you lose your health, will you still have joy? If you lose your health, let's face it, we're all getting older and I'm sitting in now trying to, I'm, 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 I'm moving my knee back and forth, my knee killing me. I'm like, where is this coming from? <laughs> okay, if you lose your health, will you still have joy? Okay, now here we go. We may never know that God is enough until God is all we have. Mm. Somebody just said that. Sometimes we, you know, we, 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 can, we can learn to live with a whole lot less than we do. All right. Oh, yeah. We find out that God is all we have and he is enough. He is enough. We, ne we may never know that God is enough until God is all we have. Okay. Now, when we find out that God is all we have, we're going to find out, just like a backer, that not only is God necessary, but he's enough. Let me read that again. When we find out that God is all we have, we're going to find out, just like a backer, that not only is God necessary, but he's enough. He's enough. He's all we really need. All the other stuff is really distractions. All the stuff we, we you know... Sometimes we call it blessings, but really, sometimes it's really a distraction. You know, we call them blessings, but sometimes they are distractions. Okay. When we find out that God is all we have. We're going to find out, just like a back, that not only is God necessary, but he's enough. Okay. Now, in verse 19, he says, I'm going to rely on the Lord. Verse 19 says, the Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. He is enough. Now, not only did Habakkuk triumph, triumph in God as his strength,
but he knew that God could be trusted. He could be trusted. He says, why? Because he says, he makes my feet like deer's feet. And he makes me tread on high places. Look at that. On high places. He could be trusted. In other words, in spite of what was going on around him, God was going to allow him to rise above it spiritually. Rise above it. Okay, that's what he's saying. He makes me tread on high places. Spiritually, I'm going to rise above it. all that's going on around me because God could be trusted. Now, when you look at deer, deer are sure-footed and they're quick so they can escape danger. How many of us know that when they run out in front of our car and they, you know, because they're all over the place now, but they're sure-footed and they're quick and they can escape danger, okay? Also, deer can also walk up mountains without slipping. They are sure-footed. They really are. God has made them that. They're sure-footed. He compares what God does with us with like deer. He says, he will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills. Right? And what is this? It's a picture of God strengthening us and giving us sure-footing during trials. I'll get that. Get that. Get that. He compares it to a deer. It's what God does with us. In spite of all that's going on around us, we are not shaken. Okay? And he, he rises, he helps us to rise above it spiritually. He's gives us, he gives us sure footing during the trial. Everything else around us is crumbling. But listen, we're able to still walk, be steady, be sure footed. That's what he's saying. During the trial. It's a picture of God strengthening us and giving us sure footing during the trial. That's what, that's what God does, okay? Now, as we wrap this up, God doesn't always change the circumstances, but he can change me to meet the circumstances. And many times that's what he does. And the stuff going on around us is not gonna change, but he changes me in the midst of it. He strengthens me in the midst of it. He changes me so that I can handle the circumstances. Also, G. Campbell Morgan said this. He said, our joy is in proportion to our trust. And our trust is in proportion to our knowledge of God. Okay? How has God revealed himself to us? I've got to trust him, no matter what I see. That's where the joy comes from. It is, it is understanding who God is. And because joy can't be based upon my circumstances. It can't. It's God got to rest in who God is. That's where the joy comes from. I rest in who God is. And that's what it means to live by faith. We are called to live by faith. No matter what we see around us, we got to live by faith. We got to trust what God said. We got to rest in what he said. Embrace what he said. Okay? That's what he says. Okay? And that's what Habakkuk is showing us here. Okay? So, um, in spite of all that we see around us and all uh, all the changes, because listen, stuff changing every day. Every day, it's something new. It's something different every single day. That's why we can't, listen, if you sit and watch the news all day, your head will be spinning, because <laughs> every station is saying something different. That's why, I listen, you can't rest in it. Listen, I got to trust God in the midst of this crazy times. I got to rest in what he said. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for our time together. Thank you for this reminder, this challenge from this great book, uh, written many years ago, but still applicable for this time. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just encourage your people. Help us, Lord, help us to rest in who you are. Help us to wait, to stand still, to sit still, and to be still. Lord, help us, Lord. we need your help. And so Lord, we thank you again for our time. We bless you in Jesus' name, amen, amen. look to him and ask him to do what he always does that is bless us as he gathers together and keeps us when we are apart let us pray almighty god you are great and greatly to be praised greatly to be worshiped 
Yes, you are wonderful. You're marvelous. You're a counselor. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we have the privilege of remembering how great you are and how good you are to us. The very essence of your person is that you're good and that you have kept us, Lord, since we last gathered. You have answered our prayers. You have had fellowship with us. You have chastised some of us that have been out of order. So we ask that you would forgive us of our sin, that you'd wash and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that there'd be nothing between us and you today, to this evening, that our prayers may be heard and that you will answer them, that you will speak to our hearts. We thank you for your demonstration of your love toward us and that we always remember why and how we are, why we're here. It is because Jesus came to rescue us from the market of sin. We confess that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And so we, tonight we surrender our hearts to you. We thank you again for the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, who sent the Holy Spirit to continue the work that he had done, that is forming Christ likeness, uh, fruit of the Spirit in us love, joy, peace, long suffering, self control, and others. We thank you again that we cannot do these things on our own. We thank you have not left us here to do them on our own. You have promised. Jesus promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And so he sent God, the Holy Spirit, who's with us right now and who's uh, helping us to in this prayer. Well, sometimes, Lord, we don't even know what to pray for. And sometimes we are strict and we are restricted. Sometimes we are, we are, we are in pain. Sometimes we are in situations where we just can't say the words that we want to utter. Our vocabulary won't allow us to do so. Sometimes we just groan. But, you, but the Holy Spirit takes those things and, and reveals them to you, our hearts, issues. And you respond. We thank you again for what you have done as bring, bringing us together tonight. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher and that he would make things clear to each one. Speak to us corporately and individually and that we will know that we only was entertained by a vessel, one that's prepared to be ready to be used by you to speak to the hearts of your people. Let, let, let each one realize that you and you alone are the one that we are to worship and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, tonight I'm going to continue our study in the, in the work of the God, the Holy Spirit in the world today. That's our topic that we've been dealing with for a period of weeks. And I shall be. For some of you, it will be something that we went over last week, but for some, for some who were not with us last week, to give you an opportunity to get a, at least a, the context in which we are reviewing some some scriptures taken out of the books, Book of Acts and others that speaks on the Holy Spirit, not just the Book of Acts only. There are other scriptures that also re reveal to us the power, presence, and the purpose of God, the Holy Spirit. So, and so as we began our study, we said there were about five things that I believe that we were going to look at when we look at the work of the God, the Holy Spirit in the world today. The first one we was going to look at was uh, the Holy Spirit fills believers as they yield to him and allow him to control their lives. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. But there were four others that we, we, we will be getting into. And sometimes that may be part of the second point. The second point was the Holy Spirit leads believers and shed light on the scriptures as, as the believer lives their lives daily. Third one is the Holy Spirit helper. He, and he's a helper who helps believers to learn better the things of God or the word of God. And, and the, the Holy Spirit gives believers the fruit of the spirit of character. And the Holy Spirit gives believers the gift of the Holy Spirit for Christian service. Those are some of the things that we're going to look at as time goes on, as time permits. Of course, we use this uh, uh, book of Acts diagram. I don't have, I, I like to use uh, icons to make points when I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm not, I'm not even tempted to try to make a, uh, some type of icon with the Holy Spirit. He's invisible. So we're going to leave it at that. He's, going, he's working his power. We know he's present. But then sometimes we forget that he's present, don't we? 
because we, we, we think in terms of Jesus being present because he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us in, uh, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 28. In verses 19 and 20, we call it Great Commission. But uh, the Holy Spirit is present with us, and he, he is God. We talked about that. He has personality, he has intellect, he has will, and he has emotions. We, we studied that. And so, but this diagram tells us about his, he brought the church into existence. And its origin at Acts chapter 2. The, the Old Testament prophets never knew anything about the church. The church is a mystery. We talked about that last, last week from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So we'll look at our notes tonight. Only one day of Pentecost, make sure that we understand that. The filling, the, the indwelling and the filling of the Holy Spirit is a one-time experience. Only can be experienced one, once, once, and that was at Pentecost. You and I, when we are saved, the Holy Spirit takes a residence in our, in our hearts, and then he, he remains there. Then we are to, we are to be, he, the, the command to you and I is to be filled. We'll talk a little bit about what that means tonight. And that's, but you, you don't play, find any place on, on, in Acts chapter 2 where when the Holy Ghost fell on them, they were in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. Jesus had told them to go to a place and wait until the Holy Spirit would come. He came as as, uh, as uh, uh, the Lord had promised, of course, and they were all in the upper room, 120. They spoke in this, these languages, lang known languages. We, we, we talked about that briefly. These were language, you know, the language that actually spelled out. It's not some kind of unknown language. And, it, and there were the devout men from each, uh, each Jewish man, by the way, from each nation, it says, in Acts chapter 1. But the point I'm trying to make is this. It's a one-time experience and only occurred at Pentecost. When you and I, we are saved, we're born again into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit takes a residence. But you and I are commanded to be filled. We're going to talk a little bit about that. It's something The Holy Spirit did something to, to those in the book of Acts. And, and then, and, but now he's asking you and I to yield. And then he'll do those things in our lives, too. That's how he worked. Now, it was all, like I said, it was all devout Jewish men who believed on the name of Jesus. It went into well and feel. That's a one-time act with the Holy Spirit once, once and for all. I want to keep on emphasizing that. This whole this, this idea of being devout is careful in fulfilling religious duties or pious. Uh, we, we, we think of uh, we think of uh, the, the over in Acts chapter 10, we think of Cornelius. He was a, a religious man and he, and he was devout. He was a man who uh, he was a Gentile, but he also uh, was a, a commander an army in the, in the Roman army. He uh, also uh, helped and gave arm, arms to the uh, Jewish synagogue for building. And so he was a, that was that's a, he's an example of what we we, can, we we describe as a devout man. And these are people who are careful and fulfilling religious duties, not religious duties. They are open to certain things, and their hearts are open. And we'll, we know that the Lord opened Lydia's heart. Because she too was a devout person. Remember, she was a seller of purple and she didn't fill a pie. She was down by the by the by the water, by the by the by the river there. And they had a meeting because apparently they didn't have 10 Jewish men in, a, in, in Philippi who wanted to be a start a synagogue. Because uh they take 10 men to do so. But if, uh, if you don't have 10 men, then they couldn't start a synagogue. So she was she was devout. She did, she was a leader. She was not the she was not the priest. She was not the pastor. She was not, she was a, a worshiper of God, a one a devout person. But God opened up her heart. The Holy it said the Scripture says the Holy Spirit opened her heart. That's what I'm trying to say, as a, as the Scripture says. And she she of course she got saved, and then she opened up her house. Apparently she was a well a person of well to do. She opened up a house, and Paul and Silas were released from prison in Acts chapter 16. You remember, uh, if you can recall, she invited them to her house. She uh, dressed their wounds and fed them and gave them room and board for a while. And uh, then they left and went out of the city. Work of the Holy Spirit. What does he do? He baptized believers, places them into the body of Christ and move on. Well, by one spirit, we all are baptized into one body. Well, body of the Jews or Greeks, whether it should be whether Jews or Greeks. 
whether the slaves, whether slaves are free and have all been made to drink into one spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And uh, I think I, I, I'm referring to eight of our other works that we had already studied, so I'm not going to go back that far. Other information on that. I'm just trying to brief. This is a brief, brief. I'm going real fast. This is a brief overview of what we're talking about to keep things in the context so we can get on what I studied tonight. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, interesting. Now, in every instance, you'll see that salvation is of the Lord. We are to obey God, yield to his will, be willing vessels, as I was trying to say in my prayer. Maybe the words weren't clear. We are empty vessels that God can fill and speak through us, and then the gospel message go out. People hear it, get saved, but salvation, I'm so glad that God has set it up that way, has made it clear that we are not in any way uh, affecting salvation except for being willing vessels to proclaim the gospel, to sow seeds. That's what we are. We are seed sowers only. Jo Jonah 2 9 says, Salvation is of the Lord. And Jonah is a perfect example of why salvation is of the Lord because God commanded Jonah to go to a particular place, Jonah uh, to Nineveh, Jonah, Jonah went the opposite. Of course, God, God prepared a, a, vessel, a, a, a special fish. God uh, uh, allowed uh, uh, to keep uh, Jonah alive in the fish, and then he brought him up in placement. So he was saved from death, but God is the one who saved him. That's why you find in, in a, in, as in, a, 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 in, in Daniel's case, and in, in, in our case, too, salvation is strictly from the God, from God. And it's based on faith in what God has told us. No one is in heaven that, apart from those who have believed the words of God. That's it. We, that's what we're commanded to do. And I find it very, very, very encouraging that not only does the Holy Spirit uh, does these things, see the work of the Holy Spirit, baptizing believers and place them into the body of Christ, but he also... Uh, uh, gives us that matter of faith to believe. But again, there's a heart that's open to uh, the, the, th the spiritual things. And then there is a heart that's, that's, that's rebelling against all spiritual things and not interested in them at all. Well, only God knows these things. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is, he is not of his. We know that. The now note that the inability to see and understand spiritual things is not the fault of the intelligence, but of the heart. There's no one smart enough and they can figure out who God is and someone so un unlearned that they could uh, not, not really understand the gospel. There is no such person. I agree with Juan Wordsby when he says that. He says the inability to see and, under see and understand spiritual things is not the fault of the intelligence but of the heart, the eyes of the Lord must be open. I'm sorry, the eyes of the heart must be opened by this Holy Spirit. Three words me on that, that's what he said. Now, this is what we're gonna start on tonight, a new uh, scriptures that we're gonna be looking at. If you have your Bible, open, open, open your Bible with me with uh, to Acts chapter four. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a presentation, I'm gonna read from Acts chapter four, but we're gonna spend most of our time in Acts chapter three and perhaps in, in Ephesians chapter five. But I want to read from Acts chapter 4. I'll read verses 13 to 22. That's where we'll launch our study from. I'm reading from the New King James translation. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and emphasis, boldness, boldness of Peter and John, and, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled that they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could not say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside, go aside out to the, of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed that a noble miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But so that, it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them to not to speak at all, not, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. 
for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. Verse 22. Oh, well, the man was over 40 years old when this miracle of healing had been performed. And so now we're going to spend some time, as I said before, in Acts uh, chapter uh, uh, 3. And, and the point is, you won't find the Holy Spirit in Act mentioned. His name will not be mentioned in Acts chapter 3. And I'm going to contrast Acts chapter 3 with Acts chapter 4. But you will see his work. Now, in my life today and in your life, we, 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 the Holy Spirit's name may not be mentioned by us. And I like when I was reading a Charles Stanley's book on, on a spirit-filled life, he said that uh, he, he hardly even knew about the Holy Spirit. About, I think it's about 40 years old or something to that matter. He, he, church, he, he, he said he was familiar with was, uh, they, they, he, he said he was familiar with Jesus and God the Father, but he said he never uh, uh, was really, really uh, uh, concerned about God, the Holy Spirit. And those are the very words. And then he said, uh, after he found out that God, the Holy Spirit was God, he knew he was God, but he said what, what kind of threw him off was, and then in New King James referred to him as the Holy Ghost. And he said by using the word, the term Holy Ghost, he, he, was a, he didn't really want to, you know, he didn't associate that with anything that was comfortable with him, so he didn't really pay much attention to it. But then they found out about who God the Holy Spirit is. <laughs> and I mean, he was really consumed with it. And he said, yes, he talked to him. And I do too. I talk to him personally on, on occasion. I sure do. And so I, I don't, if, if someone uh, call you up and say, look, this guy copping, he might be off. No, I'm talking to the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's what's going on now. Everybody I've seen talking to themselves, they talk to the Holy Spirit, but that's another issue. Okay. Now, as we go further in the study, I'll, and I, I fail to do so from the beginning, if you have something to add to what we're talking about and encourage us in the way of edification, please feel free to share with us. Uh, but let me look at number four, the walk of the believer, built by God, the Holy Spirit. It, we are witnesses. Remember in Acts chapter one, uh, verse eight talks, talks in terms of uh Says uh, when Jesus said, "When you when you uh, you you will be in the do with power from on high." And that's what he said. He told them and that they would uh, 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 be able to be witnesses. The word really, the witness in in, in chapter one, verse eight of Acts, really has the idea of mod as being being martyr. But since we only have, uh, as I said, and I usually I usually re refer to or, or refer to this. Uh, uh, a truth that I, that that sometimes help help at least help me to understand the Bible and help me to dig in the scriptures more is this when you when you see a word like witness witness the Greek and the word, word witness that I have on the screen which was word it may be three or four Greek words that mean witness as a matter of fact I know at least three I think but the point of what is the point the point is this that's why it's important to keep the scriptures in this context and search the scriptures. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need to understand, as as our words be said, what is what 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 is being said, because you need to know who he's talking to and, and what the audience is and what the time and what is the purpose. You need to know these things. Everything is not written for you individually, but everything is written for our admonition. It's as principles we can learn from it. That's the point. The point I'm trying to make here is that. Uh, witnesses, a witness can be martyr, a witness can be a person who tells what he sees or what he hears. That's basically the definition of a witness. Yeah, walk. This whole idea of walking, when I use this word walk or, or the believer, I'm, 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 figure, I'm using a figuratively speech, which means a person's conduct or way of life. See, it's two things. Witness is a person who tells who tells what he has seen and what he has heard, but also the way he lives his life also is a witness is, is also. Let me say that again. Let me say it again. A witness is a person who tells what he has seen and what he has heard, but he also lives a certain, his lifestyle witness is as a witness also. When we say we are Christians, we have, I mean, Chris, 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 a Christian is Christ likeness. That means that we should have the character attributes of Christ in our lives. And that's 24 seven then. It's not uh, on your on, on in your house or in, the, in your community or, or on your job. 
you can have a different kind of uh, attitude or different conduct whether the, than when you are at the church where Genesis or in the parking lot or talking to one another or we're, we're doing uh, work with one another. We have our, we have our language, we have our, our everything intact. We, we talk, uh, uh, we say words that we understand that sort of thing. But then when we leave that, con when we leave one from one another, the gathering, we are church with one another mindset. When we leave and go, up, go our separate ways, does not mean that we should then be like the world. Because if we do, then how is the how is the unbelievers going to be able to see Christ likeness in us? As you and I are physically uh, uh, made into the spiritually made into the image of God and physical, well to look like Him in, in some ways, well to do some things that that, that well to do things that not something, but do things that look that God would do. That we have to be a people who are seeking to be good to one another, love because well, God is good. We well, to be a people who are seeking to love one another because God is love. There ought to be a people who are holy. Yes, we ought to be a holy. You say, wow, where do you get that term from? Well, it's, it's, it, we, are, we are told to be holy for I am holy. If, if the character, if, if the essence of God's character is that he is holy, then we should live, seek to live holy too, meaning that we would be set apart. All it means is being set apart from, from practicing the, the, the wicked things of the world. That's all. I ain't going to get into the movies that you watch or the plays that you go to or that sort of thing. It's your personal thing, but I'm going to say this. The whole, uh, what is the point? The point is the Holy Spirit is there with you. That's the whole point I'm trying to make. I'm saying, I hope I'm not rambling on. The point I'm trying to make is that the Holy Spirit is with you 24 hours. He indwells you. He's with you. He knows everything we think. He even knows what we think about. And if we don't, he wouldn't say. And he is trying to reveal himself to us. I heard pastors say many, many times, do you think that God has given you a word and given you uh, uh, all that he can give you, you and I, that we might know him, that he would hide, keep something from us? I mean, why would he do that? God wants to reveal himself to us. God is spirit. And God desires that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he desires that we look like him, talk like him, walk like him, and, and we fall short. And we say we, if we say we don't fall short, First John tells us in chapter three that we lie if we say we don't have no sin. Each one of us have sin. But and and, and uh, but the whole idea is we don't have to. That's what uh, now that's what uh, uh first first John chapter two, verse one says. Oh, he, he, that's why he's writing to us that we do not have we, we don't have to sin, but when we do, the Holy Spirit, as I'm talking about, he will convince convict us and convince us, and then we, we can repent in our relationship, not, not relationship, but our fellowship with, with the Lord Jesus and with God the Father and with the Holy Spirit who's in us continues. So he's always speaking. We just don't uh, really, really always uh, listen. And so, uh, we, so of course, we said that one of our, one of our reasons for, for, for studying this lesson was to sharpen our awareness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're doing this study, to sharpen our awareness of the Holy Spirit who's with us. That's the purpose of this of this, of this uh, this is the study that we we'll, we'll, we'll listen to. Okay. All right, now let's now let's look at this walking. So walk. When I say walk, here, I'm talking about figuratively, which means a person's conduct or way of life. And we'll see that this cuts going to be covered in Acts chapter three and Acts chapter chapter four. And that's that. And that's what we have here. We have the spirit and the church. That's what that's what this is about. We're going to look at Peter. Peter was the called the apostle to the to the Jews. Then we're going to look at Philip, who went to the Samaritans. He was a he was an evangelist, by the way. Then we we'll look at Paul, who was called uh, to uh, to the Gentiles. Now, if you look at Acts chapter one verse eight, you'll see how the gospel is to the. This is how this is really. I'll turn there. This is the uh, outline of the book of Acts. Look at if you turn with me briefly back to one. I'll just look at. Uh, I just want to make this point from the scripture. Acts chapter one verse eight, which is part of the Great Commission, is it? As, as you heard me say before, it's given to the first five books of the Bible. Uh, but uh, I want to make sure that we, from the Scriptures, we know that this is actually an outline of the Book of Acts. Acts chapter one verse eight. But you shall receive power. There it is, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. There the word are uh, martyrs, or witness to to me. No, in Jerusalem. That's what Peter. That's what Peter is now. We're going to be looking at tonight. And then uh, uh, Jerusalem and into all Judea and Samaria, 
Philip is going to go down to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. That's Paul. Believers must be constantly paying attention to how carefully they, they are walking daily in respect to the righteous demands of God's word. We are, we're not under law, which I always believe is, and I, you, you can, you can, you can uh, take issue with me on this. To me, the age of grace is, can be more challenging than living, living under the law. If someone gives you a set of rules to, to obey, most of us can do, can do most of them. We'll, we'll try to do them. But the grace has to do with the heart. It's a heart issue. It's not, it's not how, what, how we do. The, the, let me say this. The law is an extension, really, of God's character. That's all it is. It's an outward. What, what, what God did, he, he wrote out on, on, on those uh, tablets that the pastor talked about in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Exodus. He wrote, it, he wrote out his character, the, his character, what he's like, his attributes on, on some stuff. That's all. But, it's, but the grace is an outward. When you and I act, we have to act on these things because they are in us. They are part of us because we have been born again into the family of God. That's all I'm trying to say. So, but it's a daily walk. And we've got to do so in righteousness. Not in, in there. So there are some parameters. There's some right. There, yeah, grace has parameters. Grace has parameters. What are the parameters? Those things that please the Lord. That's it. Those walking, that, those doing those things that please, please the Lord. I pray every day that I, my aim is to be ple well pleasing to the Lord. That's it. And do I fall short? Yes, I do. Do I admit that I fall short? I do, and I, and I confess my sin. The idea is, well, I know I don't have to. That's the whole thing. I do not have to. I do not have to walk outside of the will of God. I don't have to, because He has given me every provision, not not to be not not to deviate from what He has given unto me. But grace is something that I have not earned, not at all. Again, it's, it's, it's given. It's, he has given me his son. He has given me the Holy Spirit. He's given me his word. What else did God, would God need to give me in order that I might be accurately walking in righteousness or learning his word and walking in righteousness? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So if we are led by the Spirit, as we find in Galatians chapter 5, I believe it is, verse 13, I believe it is, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What we have against us working is, against us is our old nature, which is, which is referred to as the flesh. If we have, if we, it's, it's spelled out in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. All that's in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three things that's in the world. But the flesh is our old nature. Then we have one other. We, we, then we have, we have another one that's after us too. That is the enemy, who is the, the devil and his demons, who are liars. And so we have these things working against us. But the Holy Spirit is greater than all. I'm saying the Holy Spirit is greater than all of these who are against us. And we do not have to, we do not have to respond in an unrighteous way at all we do not have to and when i think about myself and how i respond that, there's a conviction right away because i know i don't have to i do not have to respond that way if i would just stop and listen to the holy spirit and, and he gave me warning and, God, and as, it, as we find in first corinthians chapter 10 he always gives us a way of escape sure he does god is gracious and god is good he's wonderful as, as they were saying earlier we know he is Believers walk in faith and not by, uh, we, believers walk in faith by Holy Ghost power. We, we, we know that in uh, what 1 Corinthians 5, 7 said, we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we do. But we must work. We can only walk that way by the Holy Ghost power and not in our own knowledge, our own thing. That's impossible for us to do in our own way. God has given us everything we need to live holy and be a witness for him. Now, what is the purpose of this study? To sharpen our awareness of how the Holy Spirit commands believers to be filled as he leads them in boldness and witnesses for Jesus, as witnesses for Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what we're going to focus on tonight, the remainder of our time. We're going to slowly walk our way through this. 
And when they had, oh, note this, and when they all had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. It's interesting, as I find, and, and as, as I read earlier to you from, from Acts chapter 4, that the first thing that the enemy sought to do was to stop the witness or the speaking or using of the name Jesus. We just got through a study, uh, study called, we, uh, I, we, will not, I, I, we Will Not Be Silenced. It, it's, uh, he started off from the beginning. Try, they killed the Prince of Life to stop Jesus from speaking. He was God raised him from the dead. He rose himself. He raised himself from the dead as well as the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. You find it, records of that in the Bible. We have to serve one God. God raised him from the dead. They couldn't stop him. So now he is uh, 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 ascended, has, having completed what he, he began, that is to seek and save that which was lost. He has paid all of the wages of our sin, gone back and, and then took a seat at the right hand of the Father. And then he sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one there who's doing the work, but he's, 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 he doesn't bring attention to himself. He gives us the power to yield our will to his will and be under control of the Holy Spirit. Yielding is, 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 a, is a challenge for you and I, and he's given us the power to yield. But again, we don't always do so. James tells us what happens. James chapter 1, verse 14, 15 tells us what happens. As, as Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs also tells us, as a man thinketh, so is he. What we think about, what we think on, we will act upon it. We can, we can think, we can think about the word of God. We can think about the Holy Spirit who's with us. We'll, we'll, we'll be attuned to him. We think about our own desires and our own thoughts. We'll think about things that are in the world. And, and once we do that, our old nature will click into those things that, that attract us. And next thing we know, we are heading in the wrong direction, surely. Not walking in the path of righteousness, not at all. Yes, even the believers. Acts chapter 14, verses uh, 13 through 31. I just read that. Really, I didn't go all the way to 31. I just read to 32. We'll cover 23 to 31 if, if, if time permits. But we just want to just want to focus on being filled, what it, what it means. Hey, the believer's preparation is a command to walk in boldness as witnesses for Jesus. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. We're going to spend some time here. And I think this is this is the key. Being filled is the key. If we're not filled with the Holy Spirit if he's not controlling us. And note that I agree with J. Brandon McGee says this. He says, uh, everything that we do must be and that God will recognize as, as uh, worthy is done as we are in, being led by the Holy Spirit. He said, anything, everything else we do, is not uh, God will not honor that. No matter, that's why I guess in uh, was it in uh, Matthew chapter seven, we find those people who did those things. I think around 24, 25. Didn't we do these things in your name? He he said, "Depart from me, you workers of iniquity." I never knew. He called them wicked workers. They said they did miracles in your name. We did this. We did that. And he didn't ever say they didn't do them. His point was, he never knew them. And I agree with uh, McGee, and I think I found a scripture. Galatians chapter, I think it's Galatians chapter six. Galatians chapter five talks about in terms of uh, I've been crucified with Christ. Uh, the life I now live is not my, Christ lives his life in me. Therefore, that's how I'm to walk with boldness as a witness for Jesus Christ. And those are the things that will, I will get, will, I'll show I will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of all of my works, whether good or bad. That's what it said, good or no, good or bad. Well, this whole idea, let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter, chapter 5. I'll read uh, verses 15 and 16. I could have had these chapters marked off, but I found out if I mark them off, you turn into your your turning your your Bible trying to find the scriptures as I am, then I'll go to the scripture, read it, and you won't even be caught up. I thought about that. I could mark the mark these scriptures off that I use. I have deliberately not done so, so that we can turn together and find them together, and then read them together. And we'll all be in one accord. Amen. 
Some of you may have may, may arrive there before I do. That's fine too. But if I mark them all out, I can turn right to them and start reading. It would be would be helpful. Benefit your retreat. I don't think so. Maybe in some instances, maybe not all the time. I just thought I'd give you think, give you what I'm thinking. Okay, let's look at Ephesians chapter five, verse fifteen. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, as as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wow, that is a challenge. And surely the days where we live are very evil. What 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 what, what he's talk? What is he referring to when he talks about that? But first, first thing we're going to do. Uh, we're going to form, let me, let me back up, let me back up. Be forming in the mind fruit, fruitful ways to walk. We've got to be forming in our mind fruitful ways to walk, thinking about the ways to walk. Note, it's all about what we think about, what we think about, because, you know, we have the desires of the mind. That's found in, the, in, in, our, in our Ephesians chapter 2. The desires of the mind. And the mind can desire good things, can desire evil things. Really, it is all predicated on the conditioning of our heart, the soil of our heart. Now, of course, uh, we know our eyes lusted after things, and our mind also lusted after things, and they can work against us. So, but we need to be forming the, in the mind fruitful ways to walk. How do we know this? We're going to have, we're going to, have to know the Word of God, and we're going to, have to depend on the on the Holy Spirit. This whole okay. So then we look at verse five. We say, see. It means to be discerned mentally, to observe, perceive, consider, contemplate, look into the sense of taking care, careful, or care of. That's the idea. And then if we look at our verse, uh, we look at the word, let's look at the word circumspectively. This means exact. In other words, we want to be exact be doing what God has called us to do according to his word, according to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, according to the unction of the Holy Spirit, according to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, but to do exactly what God has told us to do. That is to love one another as ourselves. He's commanded, this is a command, to love one another as ourselves. So love first to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love one another as ourselves, and to love our enemy as well. And I fall short. And every time I think of that scripture, I say, Lord, I fall so, so, so short of that scripture because I can't, I have the power to love my enemies. The Holy Spirit within me gives me the power to love my enemies. So I ought to be able to love everyone who, who's, who, who's a born again believer or who's in, a, in the church at, at, at Genesis. Since we are a church of a one another mindset, there's not a person at Genesis Bible Fellowship Church that I shouldn't love as myself. That's God's standard. I, I, I said the standard of grace. Was, was higher than the law, at least in my humble explanation, explanation. But, so we ought to be forming in our mind fruitful ways to walk. In verse 16 says, uh, redeeming the time. Why? Why, why should you, because the days are evil. They will be tempted to look away from what is, what is good, what is wise, to something that is unwise, evil thing. This, this idea of walk, if you got this word walk here, it's, uh, again, it's, an order, it's to order one's behavior, to conduct oneself. And we have the, we have the uh, power to do so. I'm going right back to the Holy Spirit because he is the one who gives us the power to do it. I, you, you, you can recall before you were saved, some of you may have been saved for a long time, maybe you were saved as a child, but I was. I remember walking and doing things that were out of order. And you said, well, I'm not going to do this again. But guess what? You, fall, you find yourself right back in it again. And you say it, repeat it, the same thing. But now, that's not the case at all. I can order my, my behavior, not myself, but I can yield to the Holy Spirit as he order my behavior. See, because he will change my thoughts. The Holy Spirit will, what he, he illuminates my heart to new things and new thoughts. I can, it, I, it's interesting. I can be singing, a, uh, you know, I don't know, this may not be your experience. Because I, I, once upon a time, I, I spent some time, you know, singing in rock and roll bands and doing that kind of stuff when I was younger. Some of the old songs, they do come back. I agree. They come back sometime every once in a while. And I would find myself humming one up. But then the Holy Spirit, I'll, I'll go right into a hymn. Right into a hymn. I can do it. 
And I know it's the Holy Spirit because the song, I'll be singing the song. And the Holy Spirit, next thing I know, I'm singing to him. Someone mentioned those hymns. I learned a lot of them because in the previous ministry where I was in, that's what we sang mostly. And they are some they are some wonderful words. And they're all focused, focused toward God. Guess what? I be rejoicing. I rejoice in those hymns, those words. Uh, uh, what language shall I borrow to thank you, dearest friend? Or some word, a word like that out of, out of him or those hymns. Uh, uh, I mean, there's just many, many, many of them. And, but I can be singing one of those uh, temptations, humming one of those temptation songs that, that, that the enemy done brought to my mind, or my own nature, either one, either one you want to blame it on. The point is the Holy Spirit is there. He gives me a way to sh sh shut them off and go another way. Now, let me say this. All worldly songs are not sinful. It is the lyrics and the words that make them sinful. That's all I'm saying. And you had to be convinced, you got to be convinced by the Holy Spirit, not by me. The whole issue is this. You have to be convinced and convicted by the Holy Spirit and not by me. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I am a vessel that's willing to be yielded to him that he might use to speak to myself first. That's why I use a lot of these that's principles that we're sharing. I'll use personal examples because I know the reality of the experience. I do. We all, we all uh, do things that we know that the Holy Spirit told, tell us not to do. We do them anyway. <laughs> there are consequences to that. I won't go there. What am I talking about? Well, to be forming, though, and I'm well to seek to form things in our mind that are fruitful. Well, where do we find these things? In the Word of God. That's, that's where we find them at. So we ought to focus on the Bible and learn the Word of God. We are to be faithful. We are to be faithful to the Lord. Purpose to walk by faith. Look at verse, five, look at verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, do not, there, uh, he says some things. Therefore, he says this. See, he, when he says see, he means uh, uh, be discerning mentally and observant that you walk, conduct yourself circumspectively sober-minded and accurately because the times are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand that which is the will of the Lord, what the Lord is. How are you going to find out what the will of the Lord is? By the Holy Spirit who wrote the word and, and, and yielding to him. That's how you find out what the will of the Lord is. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, and I think I, I don't want to misquote it when Charles Stanley talks in terms of, he said if he gave a he, if he made an advertisement, he gave an advertisement where he was preaching on this subject, uh, what he say, uh, what what is what is the will of the Lord for my life? He said people would come, but if he if he did it in the opposite way, say what is what is it that God would have me not to do or something to that effect? He said people would not come. In other words, they want to know what the will of the Lord is for their lives personally, but they don't want you to tell them what it is. In the word, that's his point. I, I, I'll I'll get that quote for you next. Time. I won't misquote it. I'll get it for you right under the book. But my, my, my study is not based on his book, but I, I do use some of his uh, uh, helpful spade work that he has done and put in on this subject because he, he talks in terms of being so, so long away from thinking about the Holy Spirit and dwelling him. And then when he learned about it, he talks about how gracious it is, how good it is, how powerful it is, how you can talk to him. He didn't say pray to him, but you can talk to him. He will guide and direct your path. And he said, so he said, now he's, he's this wonderful thing. But it took him years to get to that point. Be filled. This is the key. Be filled by the Holy Spirit as a yielding to his indwelling power and will to walk righteously. He, Holy Spirit has a God has a will for us. And what could the clash come in with my will and God's will? Will I obey or disobey? But God's will, God will not force us to yield to his will. Because see, that way he will held accountable. If God ever forced you and I to go against our will, then he would, you, we, we would be accountable. We'd say, yeah, I, t I wanted to uh, uh, do, I was going to do certain things, Lord, but you you inter inter intervened and uh, changed my will. So therefore, I'm not responsible. You will not find in the scripture where God intervened and changed a person's will. What you will find is he'll change circumstances. It caused you to change your will. He'll do that and not change your will. He doesn't get it because you still are responsible. And it goes all the way back to, I believe it goes all the way back to what he told Adam and Eve, or Adam, he didn't tell Eve, he told Adam in the garden. 
you don't, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you will die. Now you know good and evil. You, you, you are responsible for doing good or evil. And you, that's your will. That's your will. Our will is to, we are responsible from, from the day Adam died, Adam plunged us into death, not Eve. The day Adam plunged us into death and destruction. He, and, and he lied to, he said, you'll be like God. Well, he didn't say anything. Adam just deliberately sinned against God. He plunged us into death and destruction. And all that you see that's going on, all the misery, all the evil, and all that's going on, Adam is the one, one of the person responsible. His name is Adam. Do you know the person who showed us great mercy is the second Adam. His name is Jesus, the God man. Both of them was men. One was, one was man and God. Of course, Adam was a perfect man. Jesus is a perfect man and a perfect God. He fulfilled all of the requirements that a perfect man living on a perfect situation. He lived in a, in a, in a, in a crooked situation. Jesus did. Adam lived in a perfect environment. Hard sometimes to, to fathom why he would sin against God. But again, it has to do with the issue, I believe, of desire. He desired Eve more than he did God. That's, that's my opinion. Don't, don't, don't write that down. That's not, that's not opinion. The point I'm trying to make is this, that we can, we can be filled and we must be filled by the Holy Spirit. We must yield to his will, his indwelling will. And, and, and then we can do what God has called us to do. That's why men like Stephen, we might look at him uh, later on, depending upon how much time we got. That's why Stephen's the, Stephen's the first martyr, first martyr in, 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 in the New Testament. And over in uh, Acts chapter 7, if we have a chance, we might go there. The point I'm trying to make, though, is this, that Peter and John was filled, was spiritually filled in, in the book of Acts. Of course, it happened at, uh, at Pentecost. They were at Jerusalem, and, and this, this period covered about 30, 80, 33 to 80, 35. That's where they remained in, in, in Jerusalem. Remember now, the church was supposed to start in Jerusalem, move to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts, remember? Well, Peter, Peter and uh, the, 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 the church, Jerusalem church, remained in Jerusalem really until the persecution came, then they moved. But other than that, when Romans uh, uh, started persecuting them and they drove them out, and until that time, they were they were prospering and uh, uh, or at least witnessing in Jerusalem. So Peter and John were filled, with, and they were witnesses, as, as we find, as, as God promised in Acts 8, while they were in the church at Jerusalem. Now, God's spirit fills God's spirit fills servants, having a heart awareness. Remember that we said we want to be aware of the Holy Spirit, awareness of the Holy Spirit's power within them. They walk in boldness, and we see it in Acts chapter three, verse four, chapters three and four. That's what we said we're going to talk about, right? All right, let's move right along. Now, let's go over to let's go back now to Acts chapter three. We will look at verses one and ten. Like I said, you won't find the Holy Spirit. Name is not mentioned in Acts chapter three, but you will see his work. And that's the whole idea. I, want, I wanted to present to you the work of the Holy Spirit that, man, that we can act bold, although we know we, his name is not mentioned, but we see his work in men who are willing to go all the way in yielding their will to the will of God. That's the whole idea. So let's go back into Acts chapter three. Hope we're not turning too many passages that you're not keeping up following along. This is, this, is, this is what Charles Stanley said. He said this, God is looking for perfect, for, for, listen, God is looking for imperfect men and women who have learned to walk in moment by moment dependence on the Holy Spirit, Christians who have come to terms with their inadequacies, fears, and failures. Believers who have become discontent with surviving and have taken the time to investigate everything God had to offer in this life. Ah, that says a lot. I think I think he's on point. But if we look at uh, Acts chapter 3, we'll find uh, the, the apostles are they're doing some things. And they're just living their lives at the present time. And by the way, I don't see any, any, any evidence that they had in mind of going and witnessing to this particular individual that they're going to witness to. And I can tell you some experiences about witnessing. I'd like to share a few with you. Uh, some, 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 some men on here and women who, who we've been out witnessing together. I remember a time when we were 
down in uh, Patterson Park. Patterson Park, a few years ago, we went to Patterson Park, we ran into the black Israelites. Now, they can be uh, intimidating if uh, you don't rely on the Holy Spirit to, to give you power and strength to go on with your witness. They, they down there, he's in this garb, he's got wearing all this stuff, he's like some kind of a priest with all these red hat and he got his crown and all. And he, but they make so much noise. They yell, read, holler to the top of his voice, read. Yeah, he reading out the Bible, and I mean, they, and we went down there to witness to to the people in, in you know in the area, the neighborhood, and and pass and pass. But I must admit that you know when you first arrive, you say, "Wow, like where do we start?" You know, he got his, he got all this noise going on, and all these people around. But guess what? The Holy Spirit prevailed, and we went on witnessing. And some people on this on this platform tonight can tell you that they were there too. We witnessed to them. What I'm saying is not it's not easy. What I'm trying to say. It's not easy, but we, not, we weren't relying on our own flesh, but we were relying on the Holy Spirit. And we did not turn back. We, we went down and, and, and covered what the Holy Spirit would have us, have us cover. We shared the gospel with people that were in the park. Where, yeah, they was yelling and screaming over there. We were sharing the gospel over here. That's how we were. That's just one, one example. We, we've had many examples we could talk about. I'm talking about the witnessing. You start out to witness in a certain way. But God will bring certain people. And many people have come to the state of knowledge of Jesus Christ, you know, as we go out and, and they have made professions of faith. So that's, that's, and so there's an intimidation though. We have an enemy, we have an enemy that goes about like a roaring lion trying to uh, dissuade, dissuade us and trying to stop us from sharing the gospel or the name of, the, the name of Jesus. Here is, is an issue here because these uh, disciples, of course, are, uh, were uh, disciples of Christ, and people knew that. But look what they look where they go. Doesn't say that the Holy Spirit told them to go. There's a temple. I'm just giving it. See, I got to use an icon there once in a while. What's a temple look like? So we have number one. We have the prevailing place of prayer for Peter and John, for and for all Israelites, for that matter. In verse one, Acts, Acts, uh, Acts chapter three, verse one. They didn't, they didn't change their lifestyle because they became Christians because they, and, and after they, they had put Jesus to death. Now, they were afraid. Remember? remember when, when they, they all have, and, uh, we, we all know the story. We're not going to spend a lot of time on They all had committed, talking about they, I'm talking about the disciples, had all committed themselves that they would not leave Jesus. Jesus told them that they would leave him. Then after they fled, I read that earlier too, when we started off uh, uh, talking about uh, Shopping, being shop in awareness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I read that. I'm going to go back over it. What I'm going to say, though, is this. They talk about Peter and John was doing a routine thing that Jews would do. They did not see themselves as being separated from their Jewish heritage or from the temple, for that matter. But we see them here. And Peter and John went up to gather to the temple at the hour of prayer. Of the ninth hour, that was specific. That was something that they had been doing. They they knew how to do that. That's what that's what they had been doing. It was a tradition. They just said, oh, "Let's go and, and uh, find a person down there who's uh, uh, not having we haven't been able to walk in forty years that uh, that we might witness to him that he might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ." They, they didn't do that. It was going about doing what they normally do. You see that? Now, but God had, but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working here. The point is the Holy Spirit is working in them. It's the Holy Spirit that's leading them there, I believe, to go down, to go this go this way. You're going to see he's just going to prevail. He's going to prevail there. Where well, they go to the temple, the, the, the traditional hour of prayer. That's what they were doing. And I want to establish that from the scripture. And we find it in Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah 55. You'll see that. Daniel, we know Dan, we know Daniel prayed, right? But uh, it was a traditional, it was a set time that they did specific things. And they were on their way. It's like you and I, we have things to do on a set time, happens all the time. I mean, it's just a sure uh, terrain has given us so many ex examples. She is out in the mall, walking through the mall. She see a person in a barbershop. Spirit told her witness. So she went in and witnessed the man. man. Man, he needed that. It happens all the time. I mean, many of you have the same kind of story. What am I saying? But we are we had we we are witnesses for Jesus Christ 24 hours a day. This is my point. But we have to be available when the Holy Spirit press us. We have to be available to act when He tells us to act. Now, 
uh, I was hearing with a group of people that uh, uh, I think it was yesterday, how sometimes you're not always open to the Holy Spirit because of the circumstances and the things surrounding you. That's what I'm trying to say. I was down there uh, trying to uh, take care of some business downtown Baltimore, trying to, but I was looking at a meter. I don't know how those meters work uh, with the credit card and all. I was looking at trying to do that. And a lady came by and said, I missed it. Let me, let me show you how to do this. She said, because uh, you, you, you you spend too much. She said, you make yourself a target down here. So I guess the way I was fumbling around with the meter or something. I didn't know the lady. She came by. And I, talked to her, I talked to her about Jesus, though. Me and her, me and her praise the law. She, she already knew the law. Yeah, she, and so she, she came by, saw me. She, she told me something about the meters and that sort of thing. So but what I'm trying to say is every day is an opportunity to be a witness for the Lord. It is. We just don't take time. And the Holy Spirit is always, he's uh, revealing these, uh, these, uh, these uh, 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 opportunities, and I call them opportunities and privileges, really, to share the gospel. Do you know that God has in, in, in gave you and I as vessels to be used to sow seeds that, that makes a difference between heaven and hell for a soul? That's an awesome thought to think about. God has entrusted into babes, and which I am a babe, I speak of myself, the words of eternal life to babes. It make a difference between heaven and hell. Wow, what, a, what an awesome responsibility. But he, uh, he's not entrusted to us just to, just to be uh, 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 idle with it. He, he expect us to produce food. And we know it. We know, we know what the parable of the soul. We know about that. But, but look at verse, look at 50, look at 55, uh, Isaiah 55, verse 17. Oh, by the way, as I follow up on the story, when I, after I finished the meeting, I went to the city hall to take care of some business that they say I, they overcharged me for some things that for water is the issue. But anyway, I went down to see him. As I was walking up the steps, going to walk the steps, there was a man lying on the front end of the, on the street, on his back. But the time was running out. I'm going to tell you about the circumstance. Now, this is what I gave there. The Holy Spirit said, you're going to pass by the man, the man laying out, you don't know if he's dead or what. I said, but the time is running out. He was, but he was laying out too far from me. I said, but I'm getting, I know if I got to get in him. You know, so I, as, I was, as I was contemplating and resisting the Holy Spirit, a woman came, another woman came by there. And put five dollars on the chest on the man's chest and kept on walking. She didn't contemplate her. She just gave five dollars, kept on going. What did I do? I thought about it. I went on, I went, I went into there. I said, Well, I'll catch him when I come back. Because if they didn't give it clothes, I messed around. And guess what? When I came back, the man was gone. I don't know if he was a plant, he got the five dollars, got up and left. I don't know what the deal was, but I know one thing. I did not witness to the man. That's the point I'm trying to make. So I asked the Lord to forgive me. I'm being real. Now, let's look at uh, 55, 17. Oh, I see that. Oh, I'm sorry, what I'm looking at says Psalm 55. Psalm 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. You and I know that when Daniel was in captivity and they, and they, by the Babylonians and they forbidden him to, well, they, 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 they uh, forbid him to everyone in the, Rome, in the Babylonian empire not to worship anyone and so forth. The image that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had made, Daniel opened up his window and he prayed to what? Jerusalem, didn't he? So this, this temple means something to the Jews. And the only thing Peter and John was doing at that time was following up on the traditions to pray at a certain hour in the temple. But look what happened. Look what happened with the Holy Spirit. Look what happened. Look at verses. Look at, look at, look what happened. Back at Acts chapter 3. Look verse 2. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms for those who enter the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go to into the temple, ask for alms. Now you know that the Holy Spirit is behind this. Now, I want you to see this. And now here we go. Here, here's the power of the Holy Spirit. And fixing his eyes on him, 
And John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expected to receive something from them. Now, here we go. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have, what, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it, was, they, they, it was not their intention to do all of that. They was going to pray. In their regular life, I'm trying to, I'm trying to emphasize, as you go, and as it says over in, in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 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 28, I'm going to go there quickly because it says that. Make, make disciples as you go. Witnessing, making disciples as you go. Teaching, look at, look at Matthew 20. I'm, I know you know it. I, I want to I reemphasize this. And we see it operate. It's interesting where they find themselves down at the temple, where they know the officials. It wasn't. It wasn't about that. They weren't. They weren't in fear or anything of, of, that, of that nature. Matthew twenty-eight. After Jesus, of course, was raised from the dead. Look at, uh, again, I'll read uh, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had appointed for them. And that's what he told them to go. When they saw him, they, they worshiped him, but some still doubted. Look, some, some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given, is been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy and of the Holy Spirit, and to observe all things that, that I command you. And Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And, and, and of course, the Holy Spirit is with them, is going to be with them. He tells them that the Holy Spirit comes down in Acts chapter 2, but what I'm trying to go, it says, make, making disciples of all nations. It, it, the idea in, in the original language is making disciples as you go. You, you bet, and I think that's one of the areas where we've been kind of well, I didn't speak for I can't, I'm not going to give a general statement. Didn't do very, we don't see much effort, fruit, fruit that we in, in our efforts to share the gospel sometimes because we don't spend the time to make take it, take make disciple. But a disciple is a learner, that's what it means of Jesus Christ. We share the gospel, but uh, but it, but the, in this case, this man is going to be not only saved, but he's also is going to be a testimony, a witness for Christ. Watch this. Verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood up and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of, of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazed at what had happened to him. You see, that, that, that is the boldness of the power of the, of the Holy Spirit because now what we're going to find out in, in, in chapter four is that just because we are, just because we are uh, uh, in the will of God, Witnessing for God doesn't mean that things are going to go easy. In fact, I would, I would, I would say, especially in the days to come, in the evil days from which we live, things that things will get progressively be, be uh, challenging. And I use the word dangerous for Christians because I think the seventies and the eighties we kind of we were in uh, in this nation, but not other nations. There are many missionaries that we read about. If you read, you get the, the book of Martyr, they are. Uh, Magazine that comes from uh, the various witnessing witnesses of those who have been called to the mission field. Each one of us have been called a witness, but there's some who have given up everything that they might save the Lord, serve the Lord, and save save those who are lost. They have given up everything, and they depend totally upon God for the prayers of the saints and for financial. Support, but many are in prison, and as we talk, some of for their very lives, some of them are being put to death. We saw 
what, what the Taliban, no, it wasn't the Taliban, what uh, they done to them in the Middle East when they, they beheaded some of them on the beach. Uh, so we know that even this day, they're being persecuted, even in Africa, mainly in some other places too, China, Russia, all over the world, Saudi Arabia. So, uh, you know, the gospel is outlawed in Saudi Arabia. You cannot witness in Saudi Arabia. It's against the law to share the gospel in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. You can, put, you can be jailed or put to death for doing so. So, the Holy Spirit is, is, is uh, convicting me and convincing me to do two things. Pray for those who are on the mission field, but they are, for those, there are some who are in this nation here who are under persecution as well, for Christ's sake. I, I read of a case uh, recently, uh, I think it was like a couple, a couple of days ago, about the about a, about a few, one who had a business making cakes the same. And this, this has been adjudicated already, I thought. In another case that went on for years, they, they, they put the man out of business, and destructed, destroyed his family. But he prevailed in court, but he, he, we went broke. Now, another case, I didn't realize, another lady was making cakes in it. You get two uh, homosexuals who wanted to get married and wanted her to make a cake for, for them, and they said no. She said no. They took it to court in the same thing. So the point is, they do not give up. They don't quit. I'm talking about the evil, people, evil days from which we live. They're going to get harder. And they, we know that the Bible tells us this. But we had the of the Holy Spirit prevailing in us. We can be bold. That's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. No matter what the obstacles are. Be bold. Be bold. Minister Carpenter. Yes. I wanted to share. Um, early in my Christian walk, I had I was catching a bus downtown. That's where I worked. Mm -hmm. And I met this lady. Her name was Sister Anderson. And she was um, she belonged to a Pentecostal church. But she always talked about, you know, salvation and getting people saved. And it was very important to her. She sat next to me this one morning. We started sitting, sitting next to each other every morning. But I would get on the bus before her. And um, when she come to sit down, it, it got so, um, I got so used to her coming that I would look forward to seeing her. And um, one day I was coming, I was leaving work. Um, at the end of the day, and I was on the bus, it was a crowded bus, and I saw Sister Anderson on the side, like when sitting on the sidewalk, it was like one of the, you know, the homeless people, um, you know, like in the gutter. She mm -hmm. was sitting on the gutter, like the side of the, you know, of the man. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just, you know, thinking she was praying for him um, at that time, but I know she said, shared the gospel with them. She was sharing the gospel with anyone and everyone in whatever state she you know she she dressed a certain way of course it was different from others so she didn't look like you know she didn't look like all jazzy you know when she, but she looked so humble and I, I used to look forward to talking to her every day she's the one that inspired me to say something to somebody that's sitting next to me on the bus I can share the gospel with them and and I had started doing that I had joined my evangelism team at my church and everything and we we went out to the streets and I was like I can do this because I've seen sister Anderson sit in the gutter I I would never I'm thinking myself I don't know how she did that because I could never see myself sitting in the gutter but I did what I did because she did so much more you know yeah. so people inspire you like we yeah. you share how you you how you share it inspires us to share yeah we can do it it's e you know it's not easy but it's doable you know you yeah. you pull, you push yourself to do it i just thought i shared it i'll never forget sister anderson that's that's, that's and that's what it's all about sister lisa that, thank you for that those comments and for the sharing that's what it's all about that's god has left us here to do to share the gospel the way we live our lives and and and, and get do word and deed, and see she had an impression. She made an impression on and, and encourage you. And that's what it's all about. We encourage one another. That's why we have Bible study. Thank you. Proof the proof of the presence of of of, of the Holy Spirit. Of course, we saw that uh, in the in the disciples there when they when they when they uh because they're going to have to pay a price for this. Oh, that's 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 the that's the temple. That's the that's the real temple there. I have to show you that. I call it that, but that's the only markup. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of sharing the gospel, the way we live our lives, and to be able to utter the scriptures line on line and precept on precept. We need to know them by memory as well as we can take our Bibles and, get, and, and read them from the Bible, but we can't always do so. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, though, who will bring those things to memory, those things that we have studied and, 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 and those things that he, we, have played, we, have, we have been diligent in learning concerning you. He will bring them to our memory and we can share them. As, as our sister said, whether she's sitting on the bus or whether, wherever the opportunity uh, prevents sentences. Uh, and the Holy Spirit will control us. We, we know that when we go to work, we'll work and we'll do our job. And we'll do our job in an excellent way. That's a testimony. And so we thank you, Dr. Evans, give an example of that. Uh, how he worked and uh, you know, he didn't do what everybody else was doing. Of course, he paid a price for it, but he prevailed. And many of us have the same testimonies too as well. I remember myself when I got saved as I was working, the people thought I, I, I was going to act a certain way. But uh, and when I didn't act that way, they wanted to know why and give an opportunity to, to share. Thank you again for being in our presence. Thank you for the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. Give us the power to do all that you have designed for us to do. Yes, specifically, things for each one of us to do. And I can't do what others do, and they can't do what I do. But you have a good purpose for us because you're a good God. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.